Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Kinseth. I'm the Director of Education here at the Meadows Museum. And uh, we're thrilled that you are joining us for um, our Learning at Lunch today, titled the 17th Century Teleconference. I am thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Nancy Cohen Israel. She's the owner of Art a la Carte, a company whose mission is to bring art to life and life to art. She's a Dallas-based art uh, historian, art educator, writer, and curator. And over the past 25 years, she's taught at colleges and museums throughout the area, including the Meadows Museum, where she is a regular lecturer and quite present um, this fall. Nancy's a regular contributor to Patron Magazine, where she writes primarily about visual arts. Her work has also been published locally in the Dallas Arts District Guide, Visit Dallas, FD Lux, and Arts and Culture, and nationally in Art LTD in Lilith. For 15 years, she's advanced the Art a la Carte's um, educational mission through her highly popular tour series, Second Saturdays. She graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a bachelor's degree in humanities, where she concentrated on late medieval art and literature in Northern Europe. She earned, earned her MA in art history from George Washington University in DC, um, where she focused on Renaissance painting. And she returned to Dallas in 1991 to be the McDermott intern in education at the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, following that, she was the director of the Edith Baker Gallery, where she focused on contemporary art. And since then, she's enjoyed really a front row seat um, in watching the kind of art scene here in Dallas-Fort Worth becoming, become increasingly um, important, uh, an increasingly important region um, for art lovers here and around the world. So with that, I am going to um, turn myself off and pass it over to Nancy. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you all so much for tuning in today. When we came up with this lecture series back in April, we were all still very much in quarantine. And so we sort of created this tongue in cheek, I created this sort of tongue in cheek series, not really thinking that we would all still be doing Zoom calls for every single thing or go to meeting or Teams or whatever platform it is that you're using. And so what I thought would be fun to do would be to look at the ways in which our collection uses the same kind of backgrounds as we all do. And I'm so glad to see all of you that we've got one person with a virtual background, a few people with your home background, and then sort of the avatar background. And we'll talk about all of these different ways that we see ourselves and each other in the collection. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with this portrait by, Alice, uh, by Antonis Moore of Alessandra Farnese in Bainton in 1561. And it's a significant portrait for a variety of reasons. Antonis Moore was a Netherlandish painter. He was born in Utrecht. He had made his way to Italy as well. He got his big career start in Antwerp. And he really revolutionized the way the Spanish court portrayed themselves in, in this very stark background. So I talk about this as the avatar view. So just with a plain back, back, black background with sort of an image right on front. And even though this was really unique to the Spanish court, it does have a pretty long history in the Netherlands. And I'm showing you here two paintings by Jan van Eyck, Man in a Red Turban, that's long been believed to be a self-portrait and a portrait of his wife, Marguerite van Eyck. And again, you can see just this plain back, back, black background. These are fabulous avatar images that really allow van Eyck's skill to shine through. First of all, Van Eyck is credited with developing the use of oil paint, which talk about revolutionizing Western painting, but also by putting himself and his wife on these black backgrounds, you really get a sense of his ability with light, with all of these wonderful um, contours in his face, and absolutely with texture, both in the turban, in his wife's lace here, in whatever these strange cone things are on her head, and then on this quality of the fur on both of them, on their clothing, and the fact that he was able to distinguish between the brown of his fur collar here and the black on the background. And this is a gigantic leap forward in Flemish painting because most backgrounds in Flemish art are more like this. 
And this is a St. Jerome in his study, in his home office, as it were, with all the attributes of St. Jerome. And this is very typical of Flemish painting. A word about this particular painting, whose attribution has been finally and decisively given to Van Eyck. It's in Detroit. And for many years, it was thought to be by Petrus Christus. But you've got all of these little symbolic things in here. You've got the hourglass to remind us the time is ticking, the lion from whose paw St. Jerome plucked out a, a piece of wood and a, a splinter. And so you've got all of those tools here. He's in his red robes of being a cardinal. He's got the Bible that he translated, etc. So I mean, these are just full and full and full of symbolism. So to suddenly have something with this just straight black background is really unique and really sort of a leap forward. I'm bringing you here three other portraits, all of Philip II, to show you sort of the progression of where Antonis More fell. So the first one, this one on the far left, is by Titian. And at this point, he's Prince Philip. He only becomes king in 1556. And what I love about this is you've got Titian, you know, a similar background. Titian was the court painter to Philip's father, Charles V, and then, of course, to Philip II. But, you know, Titian was a busy man. Titian had a lot of commissions. He painted for royalty. He was in Venice. And so, you know, he was really quite busy. But here you've got this wonderful portrait of Philip with his armor. And this is sort of the accessory table, if you will, because the armor would be commissioned in pieces. So you would commission sort of this main body piece. And then each one of these elements, the pectorals, the gloves, the helmet, the visor, those were all add-ons. So you've got this table with the accessories on it and this column in the background, this pillar representing the strength of Prince Philip. He becomes king in 1556, and in 50, 1557, Antonis More paints him. And as one of the things I mentioned to the docents a few weeks ago, is that you know it was probably easier to get Antonis More to paint. He was younger in his career, and probably cost significantly less. But he creates this image of pure power. There are no distractions, and so what you've got in this image is of Philip II, still in his riding boots, in his armor that he had commissioned specifically for his victory over the French in 1557 at the Battle of St. Quentin. And so here he is in the battle cross armor. If you look closely, you've got the battle crosses. He's still sort of fresh from battle. He's got this armband to show that he's the commander. And then this element that Moore really adds, and he adds it into all of these court portraits, and this it's this baton of power. And so if you're looking to be more authoritarian, if you've got one of these avatar backgrounds for your greens or for your um, zoom images, just put in a baton of power and show people where you stand. But you see him with this and with his hand on the sword, and he's even got his battle ready cod piece in this image. And you can see, of course, he's got his uh, Order of the Golden Fleece, et cetera, but it's just a pure power. That is the only place the, the, that is focused on. And then I brought in this portrait uh, by F. Philip II again, by Sanchez Coelho, just to show you kind of the artistic generation. So Sanchez Coelho stud studies with more and then sort of his descendants artistically, or his descendant artistically is Pantoja Juan de, uh, um, I'm sorry, Juan Pantoja de la Cruz seen here. And I'm not going to talk about these images because I'm saving them for the last gallery talk in this series. But let's go back to Alessandro Farnese. Here he is a 16 year old boy in this army, uh, in this armor. As his name implies, he comes from Italy. But his mother, Margaret of Parma, is the sister of Philip II. And Margaret of Parma has a very interesting life. She's widowed at the age of 15. And she marries Ottavio Farnese. They're both very young. It's not a great relationship. She manages to give him heirs. She gets pregnant. She gives birth to twin boys, Alessandro and his brother, his twin brother who dies within a few days. 
And so having sort of performed that duty of producing an heir, she feels kind of relatively free. And her brother, the king says, you know what? Why don't you take over the governorship of the Netherlands? Because the Netherlands, of course, are still under Spanish rule. So even though we talk of Antonis more as a Netherlandish painter, by nationality, he is also a subject of the Spanish crown. So Philip says to his sister, you go to the Netherlands. I need a governor there. I need somebody rule to rule. Bring the boy to me. And so when he's 10 years old, Alessandro Farnese goes to the court of Philip II, where he's going to learn to be a proper courtier. And that's how we see him here. Eventually, he'll grow up. He will co-rule the Netherlands with his mother. That situation doesn't work out too well. And she eventually retires so that he can, he can be the lead ruler, that he can be the governor of the Netherlands. But in this case, he's still young. We can only believe, since this is learning at lunch, I have to bring some food in, that maybe one of the treats he first enjoyed when he first got to Madrid is this leche frita, this wonderful fried dairy confection. But it gives us an idea, again, so this is sort of a, the literal icing on the cake as far as the camera off avatars. And now we'll move into these home office views. So frequent visitors to the Meadows Museum knows that this painting by Pedro Berghete is not in our permanent collection, unfortunately. It is, however, in the exhibition Alonzo Berghete, first Renaissance sculptor. And if you haven't seen the show, go see it. It's really, really beautiful. And I know it's a sculptural exhibition and this is a painting, but if I could keep one piece from this exhibition, it would be this one. And we can see Mary in her literal home office. Mary is the church. And so here we see her enthroned with the Christ child. This painting was done around 1500. And I'm just so thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about it because it was done in what's known as a Hispano-Flemish style. So Flemish, certainly Flemish painting was very favored at the court in 15th and early 16th century Spain. And here you've got all of these little elements that we think of when we think of Flemish painting. So you've got Adam and Eve in the bottom, and then they are the Old Testament prefiguration later of the New Testament. Here's the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel here, and the Virgin Mary being told that she's about to give birth, about to have this child, and this magnificent Gothic tracery. And then in here, this Mudahar imagery, this, this Islamic type element that makes this so very Spanish. And just a word about this painting, it was completed around 1500. So just to put this into perspective, the last element of Islamic rule only ended in Spain in 1492, when Granada finally fell. And in 1492, as you probably all know, the Jews had been expelled from Spain, but they still had Muslims in Spain and their expulsion orders did not come until 1502. So this is really just this incredible time in certainly for Spanish art and Spanish painting. And again, we are fortunate enough that Pedro Berghete is Alonso Berghete's father and so that we were able to get this treasure for this current exhibition. Now, if we continue within work with our, within our own collection, we've got this really, again, very unique and special piece uh, by Alonso Lopez de Herrera of these two 13th century saints, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Francis. This is painted on copper on two sides. And what's also fascinating about it is that at this point, Fray Alonso is working in Mexico City. So this painting was completed around 1632 and he moved to Mexico City in 1609. So we have a little bit of the new world in here as well. And what we have is this comparison between the vita activa, the, the active life and the vita contemplativa, the contemplative life with these two saints. St. Thomas Aquinas, who is writing, you have to just love this divine inspiration that he has of the Holy Spirit coming down through this open window to inspire him to write some of the greatest theological tracts written in his era or since uh, the Summa Theologica. See 
And then he's also wearing this gold chain, which is not meant to be a fashion statement per se. It's known as the Catena Aurea, the golden chain, which was a commentary on the gospels that he wrote. And I really feel that the fact that these are facing outwards, sort of put into the bookshelf the wrong way, as it were, is to show the, the golden elements to them, which is to his own work. The sun here represents Thomas Aquinas. It's one of his emblems as a teacher. And he is in the black, this wonderful black cassock of the Dominicans with the white habit underneath it. This is different from one of our saints, St. Saint Francis of Assisi, seen here in the wilderness in much more of a contemplative life. And here you get to see his homestead as well. So here's the hermitage in which he's living on this far right. And here he is in this continuous narrative of asking God to see him and God will see him as we will soon find out. But he um, is in the desert. He's Franciscan, he's a gray monk. And he has this vision we're told of the seraphim bearing the cru and the crucifixion. And so here you've got this beautiful image of the crucifix, the seraphim. So there's an idea of the seraphim in threes, of course, representing the Trinity. And the way that he's depicted this is here you've got St. Francis of Assisi in prayer and he sees the crucifixion and here he is in contemplation and again God is looking down on him. So he has this vision, he receives the stigmata seen here in his hands, these wounds that replicate Christ's wounds and in his chest. And that night he has, he dies and he dies hearing Psalm 42. And what does Psalm 42 tell us? In the opening lines, it says, like a hind crying for water, my soul cries for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Oh, when will I come to appear before God? So here's, here you've got the water and here you have Francis literally appearing before God in two different places. And the Psalm goes on to say, why so downcast my soul? Why disquieting within me? I have hope in God. And so here you've got him again with this crucifixion right here. So he's sort of being seen by God and experiencing God from two different directions. And the crucifix is laid across the skull, which represents Adam re representing the first man and Christ dying for, to redeem Adam's sins. And so if we continue on this theme of, of religious people, Within our collection, it brings us to two of our hermits, our desert hermits. St. Paul the Hermit, who is considered the first of the desert hermits, he was a third century hermit, and St. Jerome, who was alive in the fourth century. The story of St. Paul the Hermit is a really interesting one. He was living in Egypt. He was living under the rule of the Roman Emperor Decius, who did not favor Christians. And Paul was orphaned at the age of 15. He sought refuge in the home of a friend, but he wasn't sure that the friend's brother-in-law wouldn't betray him. So he goes into the desert for what he thinks will be a short period of time. And lo and behold, he's alone. He's finding solace. He's enjoying the time to contemplate on his own. And he's not in a big hurry to re-enter society. And I find this to be an interesting parallel because in these unprecedented times in which we find ourselves, there are people who are saying, you know what? I'm enjoying the solitude. I'm not in a big hurry to go back out in the world. And in this case, it is literally back out into the world. Now, how did St. Paul the Hermit survive? Apparently there was a stream and it, Ribera or Ribera and or his assistants do not depict this here, but a stream and a palm tree and the palm tree gave him nourishment and as well as clothing. And you sort of get that sense from the skirt that he's wearing here, the sort of a kilt like skirt made of palm fronds. Ribera has stripped this down just to this essential element of Paul in prayer and in contemplation. Often there's a raven in these depictions. The raven was the one who 
In other stories we're told after he's on his own for 21 years, a raven comes and brings him bread. And we're also told later in the story that when he dies, two lions bury him. So you often see those attributes, but here, Ribera again, just depicts him just in the pure, most essential elements of being a hermit. Conversely on the right, this is a, a beautiful painting from about 25 years later by Juan Martin Cabazalero of St. Jerome. And what I find fascinating about St. Jerome and doing research about this, you know, we all look at it and certainly all of you docents out there and all of you who are lovers of 17th century painting, you look at it and you say, oh, red robes, it's St. Jerome, of course. But fascinatingly, at the time in which Jerome was living, the office of Cardinal had not been created. So he worked for, he had an appointment by Pope Damasus I. And so as the church evolved, it sort of became standard, like if he had been alive now, he probably would have been a Cardinal. So let's just put him in red. But St. Jerome retreats, of course, there are many different stories, versions of aspects, elements of Saint, the St. Jerome story. We saw the first one of St. Jerome in his earlier study. Here we have him in, the, in a cave, again, living this very contemplative life. He's got the Bible that he translated with him. But what I think is so beautiful about this penitent saint is that we're told that he has a vision in which he hears the trumpet blasts of the last judgment. And so here you kind of have an idea, maybe there's a seraphim in that background, maybe not. But here he's praying, He's deep in contemplation, but the way that he's looking up, you get the sense that he's hearing these trumpet blasts. So the way that Cabazalero really adds sort of an audio element to a visual element is really quite unique. And the way that he casts this beautiful light on his face. So sort of the same idea that Van Eyck was doing, you know, this is the time of counter-reformation art. This is the time when the, the notion of being alone with prayer and your one-to-one -one connection with God is so important. This is a time in which, um, you know, the church is fighting hard to bring back those, those people who are protesting up north, the Protestants. And so you've got this idea of tenebrism that's so typical, this spotlighting idea that's so typical in 17th century painting. Now to bring somebody sort of from a contemporary person, we've got this wonderful painting of Sir Arthur Hopton that the docents just heard me speak about yesterday. But for those of you who were not in docent training, I'll abbreviate this painting, which again, I find to be completely enigmatic. We don't know who painted it. We do know that the subject is Sir Arthur Hopton, who at this time, 1641, was serving as the Spanish ambassador to, uh, I'm sorry, the British ambassador to Spain in Madrid. And here you see him with his very Spanish looking attendant. And again, what I find interesting about this painting, if you compare it to the time in which we find of ourselves, you know, if we were together, I would say, raise your hand if, if you try to make sure that the background is looking good and that you're not having, say in my case, things stacked up on the printer or that you don't have a bunch of things just lying around. Well, here the things are very much front and center, showing him again to be a man of physical letters, actual letters, actual correspondent, correspondence between England and Spain and England and England and you know the people with whom he had a very wide correspondence. And the other element that I brought in yesterday is that if you note, he is only wearing one glove, one beautiful Spanish glove. And there have been a number of conjectures about this. Gloves, as I mentioned yesterday, were diplomatic gifts. So this may have been one of a pair of, that he received as a diplomat. The very elongated tapered fingers were very typical of the fashion of the time. And not having a second glove was a convention that we see in a few places. You see it in Holland, you see it in England. And the notion is that by giving your beloved, your glove, you're giving this person something that has touched your skin. So there's an element of eroticism to it. And it's something that, um, you know, you sort of pull off and you just hand to the person. And so my question on this is who has that second glove? 
to whom was Sir Arthur Hopton sort of sharing this? And, and is this painting sort of acting as his second glove? Is he presenting it to somebody or is somebody presenting it to him? And unfortunately, we have no way of knowing. We know he was a big art collector. We have, we think two objects from his art collection, a little painting that is unidentifiable, another sculpture that is unidentifiable. And so we don't really have an inventory of what he owned because at his death, he died without an heir. All of his work, his collection, everything he had transferred to a nephew. And we don't know that, you know, the trail goes cold from there. We don't know what the nephew did. And again, it would be so helpful to find an inventory so that we would know not only what these objects are, but to whom this painting was given or for whom it was commissioned or by whom it was commissioned. So this sort of wraps up our home office part of the talk. And now we go into the green screen. And I know I'm seeing a couple of green screens here and you know, it's where you are or it's wish I was here, wish I was at the beach, wish I was in Europe at this point. But you know, we have these in the 17th century as well. Obviously they're not called the green screen. And within our own collection, we have this really important and significant portrait of Philip IV by Diego Velazquez. And this one is significant because Philip IV only ascends the throne two years earlier in 1621. He's a very young king. He is 16 years old when he ascends the throne. And if you can imagine putting a 16 year old in charge of his territory, which was like half of Europe and the new world, it boggles the mind. But Philip very much wanted to change the way in which court was run. And he does this through this depiction. Now this painting was done two years later. So he's 18 at this point. And he's looking for a new court artist. Velasquez is, comes from Seville, comes from this school of a lot more realism. And he comes to Madrid in 1622. And through sort of a series of placing his work strategically through different people, painting different people, finally getting it in the line of, in the vision of Philip IV, he gets to paint a portrait of Philip IV, which Philip loves. And really from that time forward, when Philip is about 18 and Velasquez is again, like 22 or 23, he becomes a court artist to Philip and a court designer and he designs balls and he designs pageantry. And Velasquez is just working really constantly for Philip IV. And if you go to the website of the Prado you'll, and you type in Velasquez, they have over 400 objects by Velasquez, many of them paintings of the court. And that's just one museum. You know, we've got uh, what three or four of his paintings right here at the Meadows Museum for which we are very, very fortunate. Now, what's different about this is he's got the Golia, this very formal starched collar. His order of the golden fleece you'll see here momentarily is not on the same kind of luxurious gold chain that we see in his predecessors, but more on a silk ribbon. And he's trying to go against what he saw as the excesses of his father's court, Philip III, this giant rav, the armor, the golden fleece, etc. But you know, the image of the king is the king. So if you want to see Philip IV, you know, with this image, you can go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and see this one. You can go to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and see this one. Or if you are lucky enough to find yourself in Madrid, go to the Prado and see this one. And so needless to say, Velasquez was not always doing these full length portraits, but the portrait head, as you may have noticed, is remarkably similar from image to image to image to image. So his assistants might do the body, but he would do the head, maybe, or his assistants would do the head. And the way that the contracts would often be written for these paintings is they would say, okay, Velasquez will do the head and his assistants will do this, or Velasquez will do the head, and in this case, the hand with the letter, and his assistants will do everything else. And often, depending on where these were going, you know, that's how much the master would do on the painting. We're also very fortunate to have this head of Mariana and apologies for the blown out slide here, but this is also known as a studio portrait. And if you see, she's wearing almost like a muslin dress. It's just very gauzy. 
And in this painting, she's about 25 years old. So Queen Mariana is Philip's niece. She was betrothed to his son, Balthasar Carlos. She arrives from Vienna to Madrid when she's 14 years old, but the, king, the prince dies. And so the prince is dead and the king's wife, Isabel of Valois has died. So Prince Philip is finding himself to be a widow or widower rather. And so she's single, he's single. Why don't they just get married? So he's in his forties, she's 14, they get married. At this point, she's 25 years old, as I mentioned, and she's changing the court style of these wigs. So this is a gigantic, really heavy wig laden with pearls and a pearl, there's a pearl in her hair. And then we'll see this again with these beautiful little diamond clips. And this is an ostrich feather. So rather than having the ostrich feather poking up, it's lying across her head. She is the mother to Margarita Teresa, who you all know, featured here in Las Meninas. And she is going to end up making the return trip. She's going to end up going to Vienna to marry Leopold I, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, and her uncle on her mother's side and her cousin on her father's side. So really kind of, you know, this, this family tree is really starting to implode. But here you can see Mariana again with this ostrich feather. This is a reflection of her and Philip IV in the background. And if we come back to this, you know, this became the, the de facto, let's use this if you want to either have a portrait for your home or you want to have a portrait that you're going to send to, to relatives. And in this case, what's interesting and how we can relate it to our time now is that you know many of us might have our zoom shirt in this case we sort of have mariana in her zoom dress because here you see the top part of it and then you see her in this in this fabulous portrait that's in france that was the one that was sent to the french relatives in the full length dress but with the same portrait head that we have right here at the meadows museum so all kinds of interesting possibilities and I really hope that all of this is inspiring you to you know, live large when you go on Zoom, if you wanna have your camera on and, and express yourself however it is that you want, either with a green screen or in person or as an avatar. And I hope that looking at these backgrounds today has made the, the foregrounds even more interesting than they've already been. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So we do have some, some time for questions. So. For those of you who um, joined a little late, we're going to invite anyone who would like to unmute themselves to ask a question, to kind of physically raise your hand, or you can use the chat box to um, type in any questions you have. Um, Nancy, to get us started, we already do have one question. Going back to the image of, of Mariana, uh, Mariana, would you be able to talk a little bit about the pearl? Yes. She's wearing? Yes, so this pearl here is this famous pearl known as La Perla Peregrina, and it only got that name in the 19th century. It was just this family heirloom prior to that. But it is this magnificent pearl that was given, found in the early 16th century by an African slave in Panama, given eventually to Philip II, who gave it to Mary Tudor, and when you look at the portrait by Antonis Moore of Mary Tudor, you can see this pearl. She's wearing a pendant with that. And there's this big, fabulous table diamond above it. And then above that, there's another diamond that had belonged to Philip's mother, Isabella of Portugal. The pearl goes through eight generations of Spanish queens. And so we'll see it again when we go back even, you can see it even better in Isabella Clara Eugenia. She's got it in her hair here. But it's just this marvelous big pearl that almost has become the Where's Waldo of Spanish queens. And you, you can find it. The queens changed the settings through the years. So it stayed the same for many generations. And then it looks as though uh, Mariana has put it, taken it out of its setting. It's hard to see here. I think we can see it better. You can see it better here. And these are the hair clips that I had alluded to. 
But if that helps, and then just sort of to give you a full PS on the Perla Peregrina, it got its name when Joseph Bonaparte took it from Spain back to France with him in the 19th century. And then from there, it went into an English collection and it stayed there for several generations. And then it went to auction in the 1960s in England and Richard Burton bought it for Elizabeth Taylor as a Valentine's Day gift. It was pretty spectacular. And she had Cartier put it into this gorgeous, gorgeous setting and it just sold at auction a few years ago with her jewels for $11 million. So hope that answers the question, but it really quite spectacular. Thank 